so thank you everyone for being here as um, I guess this is the last talk from the series. Uh, so yeah, thank you for making it this far. So this is work that I, uh, I'm just starting and this is the first time I'm presenting this data. So um, I will, I'm really looking forward to hearing it. So starting with good old Bryce, as Herb Clark would say, um, according to Bryce's influential theory of pragmatics, uh, communication is uh, considered a collaborative process governed by specific rational rules that grasp maxims. So collaborative speakers are expected to follow the maxims and be as um, informative as is required by the um, by the purpose of the exchange, they're, uh, re uh, they're required to be truthful, relevant, and perspicuous. And collaborative listeners, in turn, um, decipher ambiguous messages by expecting speakers to follow the maxims and the cooperative principle. However, Grace did not intend his theory to be solely about linguistic communication, and uh, he made the observation that the rational expectations that arise from the uh, cooperative principle and the maxims extend beyond conversation to social action more generally, and uh, he made a parallelism, for example, between uh, the amount of information that a listener needs in order to understand the speaker's message with uh, the number of screws a mechanic needs in order to fix a car. Extending this approach, pragmatic theories have explicitly pointed out that pragmatic principles extend beyond language to other types of uh, communicative actions, such as gestures or action pedagogy. And by communicative actions, we mean actions that involve an understanding of a speaker's intention to transmit a message. But there have also been attempts to extend the Gerasian principles to the so-called simple actions, which are actions that involve an understanding of an actor's intention to achieve a physical change in the world. And this could include individual actions, such as doing laundry, or uh, joint actions, such as sharing resources. Um, although, uh, despite this attempt, the link, oops, the link between uh, communicative actions and simple actions is not a straightforward one, and the two types of acts have been studied mostly independently, the one in uh, psycholinguistics and the other in, the social, in social cognitive research. And so here uh, we are making an attempt to bring the two research tradition, uh, traditions together, and the current study is asking whether children's communicative behavior is guided by broader rationality expectations shown to affect the social domain. So uh, we know uh, from research in the social domain that children do not behave the same to actors who violate social expectations. Uh, taking as an example the reciprocity norm defined as an obligation of returning favors when sharing resources which is considered to be the cornerstone of human moral and uh, cooperative development. Children seem to be sensitive to uh, violations of reciprocity, so uh, children are more likely to share resources with a partner that has previously shared with them than with a defector who has never shared. And uh, this type of understanding arises in children in uh, early preschool years around three and a half. So considering information as a type of resource, we ask whether children's communicative behavior is affected by whether a partner previously violated conversational expectations. Um, so we know that in everyday life, uh, speakers uh, constantly violate conversational expectations for different reasons. Uh, for example, if uh, someone asks, did you have any cookies, and then um, the other person says, I had some, where in fact they had all of them, then uh, they're offering a statement which is uh, semantically true, but uh, crucially is underinformative uh, because it fails to identify the um, exhaustive state of affairs. And uh, this type of violations, oops, this type of violations uh, can be misleading for listeners because they can induce a false belief. So uh, in the case of uh, our example, when B says, I had some, then this creates the expectation that there's still some cookies left 
and uh, speaker A may think that uh, he can enjoy them later with a nice cup of milk, uh, but this is not what is actually going on. So, uh, can children detect conversational violations? We know from decades of research that children um, are not uh, very good at this, so they have persistent limitations. For instance, in the case of scalar implicature, um, it has been shown across different paradigms that uh, children uh, have uh, problems identifying um, violations like this. So, for example, if children are provided with a statement like some elephants have trunks, uh, they, tend to re uh, they tend to accept them while adults uh, reject sentences like this. But, of course, we also know that if um, conversational goals are made sufficiently transparent to children, uh, they can uh, be uh, sensitive to these types of violations across a variety of phenomena. So for example, in the case of scalar implicature, we know that children give lower ratings to uh, speakers who use um, true but under informative statements such as some elephants have trunks, um, as opposed to fully informative speakers. Also, in, uh, the, in non linguistic demonstrations, it has been found that uh, children rate informants lower if they fail to uh, demonstrate all the functions of a normal toy. And in referential communication, when children uh, are presented with an ambiguous instruction, such as find the orange when there is more than one orange in view, children uh, are uh, slower to react to this type of um, instruction and they also are more likely to seek clarification. So this shows that they have detected these types of violations. Uh, of course, the other question that, I'm, that we're interested in is uh, whether uh, how children respond to speakers who violate conversational expectations and uh, there is less research on this. So, um, what we know is that children tend to mistrust uh, speakers who violate conversational expectations. So, we know <clears throat> from literature on uh, word learning that uh, children do not learn new labels from uh, speakers who were previ previously inaccurate, unreliable, or uncertain. And uh, when they are provided uh, with a demonstration of a novel toy by an under-informative speaker, they're more likely to engage in uh, self-exploration of the novel toy to make sure that they haven't uh, missed out any information. So children uh, seem to mistrust uh, this type of uh, speakers, uh, but we don't know what types of inferences, uh, whether uh, the inferences that children have about these types of interlocutors affect their um, there are inferences about them in the course of the conversation. So in the current study, we ask whether uh, children's communicative behavior is affected uh, by whether a partner previously violated conversational expectations. And specifically, we want to know whether children adjust the amount of information they give based on how informative a partner was towards them in a prior interaction. So, uh, the data I present here is uh, not the full uh, data that we want to collect. Uh, we uh, have data from 64 uh, 45 year olds, so our goal is 88 based on uh, prior analysis that we did. And the children were, uh, were recruited at Ontario Science Centre in Toronto and in the lab. So, what we asked children to do was to perform uh, two tasks with uh, uh, some speakers. So first, uh, children were uh, asked to perform an informativeness rating task uh, because we wanted to assess their understanding of uh, partner's conversational violations. So they were asked to rate the informativeness of two puppets. And then uh, they participated in a referential communication task in which uh, they were asked to describe a target object on a computer screen so that their listener, one of the puppets, could successfully identify it. So for the informativeness rating task, children were presented with two speakers, these two puppets, which were enacted by a second experimenter, and they were told that these uh, two puppets would help them find some hidden stickers. Uh, then uh, they were told that they would be asked to evaluate uh, the two speakers based on uh, how good of a job they did and they were told that if they did a very good job 
they um, we would give them a big strawberry, but if they did not do a good job, they, we should give them a small strawberry. So we use this simple two-point scale uh, that children found easy to use. Uh, for um, an example trial, it looked like this. So children were presented with three containers. Uh, then the experimenter hid a sticker uh, behind a visual barrier uh, while one of the puppets was watching. And then the puppet would offer a clue so that uh, the children could find the sticker. So uh, we had two conditions here, two within subjects conditions. So in the informative speaker condition, children hear an informative uh, clue. So uh, here there is three cups. The informative puppet would say the sticker is in the tall cup. There is only one tall cup, so this utterance would uniquely identify the location of the sticker and children would be able to find it. Well, uh, in the case of the under-informative speaker, the clue was uh, the same in terms of uh, form, but uh, in this case there were two blue cups, so uh, the clue was ambiguous. Um, we, uh, to establish that uh, the puppet's informativeness was not incidental and it was a consistent behavior, we had two trials per uh, speaker. Um, in accordance with um, work on unreliable testimony that use similar paradigms and we always presented children with the informative speaker first because prior work has shown that four-year-olds unless they're provided with the informative utterance first they fail to uh, give a lower rating to the under informative um, statement later and we wanted to make sure that even our youngest participants could really draw the contrast between the informative and the uninformative uh, speaker. Then uh, children uh, played uh, a referential communication task in which they were presented with a display like this with four objects, two of which contrasted along one dimension, and uh, one of them was the target indicated by the arrow, and they had to describe the target object to their uh, listener who was one of the puppets. So in this case, they would have to say something like, it's the blue backpack. And uh, the way we presented the referential task to the children was that we told them that now it's your turn to help uh, one of the puppets find a hidden treasure. So the puppet was given this board game and uh, in order to win a treasure, she had to collect the cards that went on these uh, squares the puppet was also given a book that had all the cards required to play the game, but the puppet did not know which one was the right card every time because the puppet did not have the arrow like the kid. So the kid's job was to help the puppet find the right cards and win the treasure. We had two uh, between subjects conditions here. Uh, children either played with the informative or helpful uh, partner and um, or with the, uh, yeah, Half of them played with the helpful partner, half of them played with the unhelpful partner. For our predictions, um, we predicted that children uh, who um, are sensitive to uh, pragmatic violations, they should give uh, a big reward to the informative speaker, but a small reward to the under-informative speaker, and we expected this to um, arise significantly above chance. And then for uh, for the referential communication task, we expected uh, children to use more target modifiers when they communicate with a helpful partner rather than the unhelpful partner. And uh, we were also interested in whether we would find any uh, individual differences. So uh, we wanted to see whether the tendency to give more information to the helpful partner would be affected by children's sensitivity to informativeness as defined by the uh, previous task, the rating task. So uh, for our results, um, here uh, we found that both four and five-year-olds offered the informative um, speaker, um, the big reward, significantly above chance, and they also gave uh, the under-informative speaker the small reward, significantly above chance. So children were pretty successful at identifying uh, the informativeness of the two interlocutors, although they were um, more successful for the uh, informative uh, speaker. Now 
turning to the results from the referential communication task, um, here what we found is that uh, five-year-olds offer more target modifiers than four-year-olds who uh, very rarely use any modifiers in our task. And uh, we also found a marginally significant different uh, interaction between age and type of partner such that, um, so this represents this difference here that uh, five-year-olds tended to uh, offer more um, target modifiers than uh, in, in the helpful partner condition than the unhelpful partner condition. But again, this is just marginally uh, significant. So we did some exploratory analysis to see uh, how pragmatic sensitivity would uh, affect um, these tendencies. So we coded children as pragmatic and non-pragmatic responders. And we coded as pragmatic responders children who gave the correct rewards to the puppet. So children who gave a big reward to the informative puppet and a small reward to the underinformative uh, puppet. And everything else was coded as uh, non-pragmatic responders. So uh, then we uh, ran the same model by including pragmatic sensitivity as a factor. And uh, this uh, did affect our results. So uh, in this case, uh, we found an interaction between a significant interaction between age and the partner, mm -hmm. such that older children tended to be uh, tended to give more information to the uh, helpful puppet as opposed to the unhelpful puppet. And because we were interested in uh, more fine-grained age distinctions here. Um, and moving forward with uh, follow-ups and more experiments, we also uh, looked at a more uh, fine-grained analysis of age. So we split our participants in three groups. So a younger group of uh, younger four-year-olds, a middle group of older four-year-olds, younger five-year-olds, and a group of older five-year-olds. So these were uh, evenly split. And what we found is that the interaction was driven by the older group. So although the younger groups did not make a distinction between the two types of partners, uh, the older group uh, did offer more information to the um, helpful uh, partner. So to summarize our findings, we found that children were sensitive to speakers' violations of informativeness. So both four and five-year-olds successfully awarded an informative speaker with a big reward and the other informative speaker with a small reward. Uh, but they were uh, more uh, successful at giving the appropriate reward to the uh, informative speaker. We also saw that informativeness increases with age, uh, as uh, five-year-olds or older children were better uh, at this than younger ones, which is something that we know from decades of uh, referential communication tasks. So this is an ability that does develop with age. Um, we also saw that older children tailored their descriptions to the informativeness of their partner. So older uh, five-year-olds were more likely to use target modifiers when communicating with a helpful uh, as opposed to an unhelpful partner. But younger five-year-olds and four-year-olds offered the same amount of modifiers to the helpful and unhelpful partner. So, of course, uh, we want to know what is the nature of the underlying mechanism behind this result. And uh, right now, we have uh, two uh, possibilities that we speculate on. So the first possibility is that children were perhaps more motivated to help the helpful partner achieve the, her goal, and that's why they offered more information. And um, we know that there's a cost associated with producing more informative descriptions, so children perhaps were more likely to assume these costs for um, the sake of the helpful comparative uh, interlocutor, which is in accordance with uh, work that I have done for uh, my PhD, in which we found that children are more likely to give information to a collaborative interlocutor as opposed to a passive interlocutor, uh, while keeping uh, other aspects of the task the same. The second possibility is that children may have penalized the unhelpful partner by offering less information than was required. So uh, this possibility would be in accordance with findings from the uh, social cognitive developmental literature where children are shown to penalize defectors. Um, 
and uh, this is an interesting uh, possibility and we would like to tease these two possibilities apart in the future. So to conclude, uh, we found that preschool age children explicitly penalized by violations of informativeness in accordance uh, with other tasks that shown, uh, have shown similar findings. We also saw, though, that uh, older preschoolers can use this type of partner-specific information to guide their linguistic behavior in subsequent interactions with these partners. And um, finally, uh, we found evidence that children's linguistic behavior is guided by uh, broader rationality expectations that are also active in the social domain, but the developmental trajectories in the two domains may be different, as uh, in the social domain, these uh, types of distinctions have been shown to arise in early preschool, preschool years, while in our case, uh, we may see them in school-age children more clearly. And uh, 